welcome to the Ask Why podcast, a series of conversations exploring the future of learning and the future of work with experts ranging from professional educators to investors, company builders, and individual learners. The way we learn and the way we work is changing rapidly. Artificial intelligence is automating ever more tasks around us, putting pressure on all of us to rescale and upscale at accelerated rates while dealing with a level of unprecedented information overload. The education system, built for an age of information scarcity and around a broadcast model of teachers and learners, is simply no longer fit for purpose. But what can be put in its place? If this is a topic you're interested in, I invite you to subscribe to our podcast by searching for hashtag AskWhy in your favorite podcast app or follow us on YouTube or TikTok and catch the video feed of these conversations, which are happening in VR. I'm your host, Joshua Werner. CEO at Mindstone, a platform that helps people become better learners. Today's guest is Pedro Vasconcelos. Pedro and I met about three years ago. He started his career at Bertelsmann in corporate development before going on to take the position of MD and CFO. He went on to Pearson, where he held positions from VP of Higher Education, VP of Global Marketing, and now VP of Ventures, Innovation and Partnerships. A quick disclaimer before the start of the conversation, Pearson Ventures are small investors in Mindstone. So th thanks for having me, Josh. So uh, my name is Pedro Vasconcelos, I'm Brazilian. Um, we met uh, through Pearson, I think, right? So uh, I, uh, I'm a corporate VC, that's what I do. I've been um, running the corporate VC arm of uh, Pearson, the learning company for about four years now. Before that, I've done different things in education for Pearson and for all the companies. So I've been in education on and off for about 10 years in different roles. So I've done strategy, I've done sales, I've done marketing. Um, I live in London with uh, my wife, two children. Um, and, you know, I've had a rich life. I think, uh, I think you know, we know how we talk about uh, in the future, people have multiple careers. Maybe I live in the future already. So, <laughs> you know, I've been a, I've been a corporate yeah. lawyer. I've been a photographer. I've done uh, multiple things. So uh, it's uh, yeah. I think we can explore some of that later. So, before we dive into any particular questions, um, I started to uh, kind of throw an interest, or what I thought was an interesting curveball to these. Uh, these conversations. So one of the mm -hmm. questions that I will be asking that I haven't, um, I, I sent you two or so in advance, but there are a bunch of others. One of them was written by Chad GPT. And okay. at, the, at the end of the interview, I will ask you to figure out if you know which one it was. <laughs> very, okay. Okay. Very good. God. What was the prompt? It's like interesting questions for a, for a podcast interview. Uh, I won't give you the prompt because that okay, might okay, give you okay. the. Yeah, sorry. I don't want to cheat. Yeah, <laughs> I'll tell you afterwards. But uh, yeah. yes, prompt engineering is a very, very real thing now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The first thing I wanted to ask you is, is really what, what do you believe to be true in your industry? Mm -hmm. That most people in your industry or in your job would disagree with okay so i i thought hard about this one and uh, um i have to start with a few kind of a caveats i think because i am i on one hand i'm a vc and vcs are very particular because they're very kind of libertarians they believe in the power of markets and incentives being very much kind of a profit and uh, optimizing for capitalism and so on and but on the other hand i'm in education which you know is made of a different type of people so i don't know with whom i have to disagree or agree on this one but i think <laughs> i think what i would say what i would say on this one is i mean let's take the vcs and i'll disagree with some of the vcs i think uh, as i said in vc um um vc very often they kind of start on the assumption that if you optimize for market forces all problems in the world will be solved. And I don't necessarily agree. I think that there are some things that, uh, that, that they deserve, are problems that deserve solving, um, are, you know, things that deserve building, pains that deserve being removed. But if you only rely on market forces, it doesn't quite work so well. I think uh, education might be one of them. 
I think a large parts of education that if you just left it to market forces, they would not be addressed. Uh, and then obviously you have kind of healthcare, you have mental health specifically, and you have maybe defense, uh, the environment, the other thing. You can align them with market forces and they solve some of the problems, but not all of the problems. So I am contrary to many of my fellow VCs, I'm a strong believer in, you know, a strong state regulation, taxes, and, you know, some, some sort of a strong activity and, uh, and directing of the economy that is not necessarily just uh, purely market forces. Okay. And how yeah. would you square that off again? So what, what would be your opinion on, on impact investing then? Uh, as you kind of try and, and take take that with, right? So the idea that that private market forces kind of drive more or less of this. How, how would you think about about that? This is is a really good question because I have personally a, a hard time understanding private in, uh, uh, um, uh, impact investing because I think you're trying to optimize for two things that are that are um, at odds with each other. So I think uh, maybe, maybe you need a formula, but maybe you need, uh, um, you need a way to, um, to explain how is it that you, you will combine those two incentives because they are by definition opposed to each other. So I think it's great. You know, I think it's great that people are doing impact investing, but uh, very often you find yourself in a situation that you either optimize for impact or you optimize for returns. So how do you make a decision in that situation, right? I mean, how do you, I mean, do you need a formula? What were, were or was the best learning experience that you have personally had in your life and why? I've had a few that were kind of a, that shaped my opinion on uh, on uh, on on things on how learning works or how relevant it is. I think an interesting one was um, I was privileged. I mean, I grew up in Brazil and went to university there. I went to a good uh, I went to a good private school, and then that led me to being accepted in good universities. And uh, so I was always I always saw myself as being someone like intellectually. Uh, um, What's the word? Uh, well positioned and uh, you know smart and uh, well articulated, etc. And the simple. And then I went and uh, I did uh, students exchange. I spent a few months uh, in secondary school in Germany, um, so before university. And uh, and just by by function of being in a different country, having having to to uh, to express myself in a different language and operate in a different environment a lot of uh, how good you think you are goes away because it, it, because you just don't function so well in, in a different environment with a different language, right? So the way you think, you know, people behave and what's expected of you and the language barriers is massive, right? So mm -hmm. is, is, uh, is, so German was my second language and I was relatively fluent at it, but still you're not proficient, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So. Um, and even today, I'm, I'm very, you know, self-aware that, uh, uh, self-conscious that, uh, you know, my English is far from perfect. So English is my third language. I've been working in English for more than 10 years, but still sometimes, you know, I catch myself using the wrong expression or saying something funny, or, you know, I just don't have the right word to say something. So I think that more than just what he means that, you know, it's hard for you to be proficient in all languages. I think the fact that, uh, there are hurdles, there are things that make they make learning difficult or they make someone expressing or leveraging or making use of their knowledge just because of a small obstacle. I think that is, that is an interesting, um, was an interesting experience to me. And, uh, can I tell another one? Cause I have another one that yeah, is, uh, yeah. um, yeah. And, and I think, um, another one or something that is, is not quite learning itself, but it's, uh, you know, now that I've, I've been studying, learning a lot with you and uh, at, with Pearson, I think it shaped my way of thinking about learning quite a lot. Um, is um, it's just I used to build and fix things with my dad a lot. My dad was a big fan of uh, you know just taking like a broken clock or a broken bike and kind of a, we had a workshop in the back of the house, and we would just you know kind of disassemble the whole thing, get all dirty with grease, and understand how things work, and then putting them back together and fixing and fine tuning it, etc. So, I think 
getting the confidence that you can take something, take it apart, understanding the building blocks, how one thing, you know, how one piece kind of fits with the other one, how they combine to do something else and, you know, how they interact. I think that it is very helpful for life because if you believe that you can, with, without previous knowledge, you can just go and learn how something works, it puts you in a growth mindset. Yeah, I had a very similar experience actually for coding as you, mm. you went through that, right? So the the first time that I, I wrote a piece of code that like, I don't know, I had to rewrite it 50 times because I had some grammar grammar mistakes somewhere and it wouldn't compile or uh, uh -huh. or go through. And then the first time it actually works and the, re the realization that you can just systematically tweak and get and fix whatever is broken until at some point it does work. And, yeah. and if it produces a result that's different than what you were looking for, you iterate again. But that whole iteration process was, was definitely something actually somewhat addictive, especially in coding when you think about it, because the feedback loop was so quick. Like you make a change and you instantly hit um, compile or see the result of what you just yeah. just did, which in, in many other fields take takes much longer, the feedback loop. Um, so yeah, yeah maybe... and code is scalable, right? Because you know, yeah. different than my example with a bicycle, I only had you know one bicycle with two wheels. So even if I have an idea about oh, I could build something with four wheels, it's it's hard because it's real life. But if it's coding, you, you know, cut paste, cut paste, you have something completely different. I mean, uh, yeah, and uh, yeah. and it, and with code because it's so scalable, it's like okay, if I can do one loop and I can build this, maybe I can do. 10 loops and I can do a hundred loops. And then exactly. it all of a sudden it becomes something super powerful and big. In relation, and going back to day to day and going back to, to learning overall, mm -hmm. uh, as you, as you think about the future of learning, um, as you think about how you invest, what do you see the biggest trends in learning today? Well, that's the one question you should be able to answer, right? So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think uh, I mean, there's a there's a few things. Obviously, we just we just mentioned it, right? I think uh, I think uh, AI becoming really consumer grade, easy to use, low low code. Um, I, I think that will change how we interact, how people interact with learning in ways that is hard for us to fathom now. I think uh, it's, it will change everything a lot. It's almost as if, you know, Google had happened overnight, right? So the way we use Google today yeah. is very different than it was in 99 when it launched. Yeah. If in 99 overnight we had gotten Google, you know, like it is today, I think it would have been <laughs> as shocking, right? Um, but I, yeah. I think, so that's one thing. Um, then there is, um, just to continue with this AI trend, there's something even deeper that is, we're thinking about the effects of AI on how learning is done today and how students interact with content today, how teachers assign, uh, assign courses and activities and grade them, et cetera, and how that has been disrupted. But there's another level that is, what do you actually need to learn? in a world where AI does a lot of the job, right? So, which is, we just yeah. spoke about Photoshop, right? It's like, mm -hmm. what, what do I actually need to learn? Is, I mean, to use a super simple example is in a world where they have Excel, do you actually need to know how to do mental maths or how to use a sliding rule? No, right? So what's mm -hmm. the, what's the equivalent of this really simplified, <laughs> uh, you know, anecdote about maths in a world of AI? So, um, so I think there's that, uh, or maybe is this, this, are there new disciplines that don't exist yet that will have to exist because we're in a world with AI and, and so universities and just education broadly defined has to adapt to, to teach or to prepare people for that future. I tend to, or uh, I'm kind of seeing some parallels with how software engineering has grown over the years, because um, today software engineering is surrounded by millions of different tools, right? Different libraries, mm -hmm. different frameworks. And so the job of a great engineer 
is only lightly correlated with their ability to code. Um, the ability to code mm -hmm. is like a, is a base level, but the ability to link everything that has been previous that that all these other libraries and tools can do is highly valued. That's how you actually build tools today. And so I yeah. wonder if the hard skills that we have put a very strong onus on for years uh, around actually the ability to like, produce a financial budget, write a marketing brief, write a contract, do things like that. I wonder how much of those end up being the first ones that are entirely automated and um, how much your ability to manipulate whatever is the most advanced vertical AI for the job you are trying to perform becomes the the stronger uh, productivity enhancer, if that makes sense, right? So the more you're able yeah. to manipulate whatever vertical AI tool you have in front of you, the more productive you can be. Just like if you know all the latest, how all the latest libraries and frameworks work inside out, you tend to be much more productive than somebody who doesn't from a software engineering perspective. Um, and I, I tested this with uh, a group of CTOs. So I asked them, but what are the what are the key things you're actually looking for in when you're hiring people? And interesting enough, the, the ability to code didn't even make top three. Mm. So like they're not even looking at an ability to code. It was yes, the ability to collaborate, the ability mm -hmm. to learn, and the ability to solve problems. And those were the three. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, mm -hmm. I think ability to learn. Um, to build on existing knowledge, to connect dots, basically. Uh, mm -hmm. And communication is very important too, because uh, yeah. it, 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 it um, yeah, I think goes on collaboration, right? This is kind of a subset yeah. of a, or a component of, a, of collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, and solving problems, because I think there's something that comes before solving problems that is the ability to define the problem, right? So the yes. problem I'm trying to solve is this, I'm optimizing for that, and this is how I'm gonna do it. Because uh, and, and that clarity of thought yeah. also helps you with your learning because you can identify, okay, I know this, I know this, that, I mean, that bit I don't understand yet might be the solution. So it, yeah. it, everything is kind of interlinked. Yeah. What will happen with degrees? Because um, I think in the last 50 years, 80 years, a degree was basically a very strong signal that you have the skills required for the workforce, right? Uh, so you would go through this initiation and, uh, and you would spend a few years within a system that would expose you to the right knowledge. You would acquire that knowledge, take some tests and you would get like the certificate. It was a very strong signal. Okay, Josh knows how to do this list of things, right? And then there's, there's also some, um, maybe some socioeconomical signaling that's going on there. You can afford to spend four years in university without mm -hmm. working. Uh, you can work hard, you are disciplined, uh, you can obey orders, like different things that go in there. But that was a strong signal, right? And, but then as we all know, in the, in the last, whatever, 15 years, 20, maybe that signal is weaker and weaker because number one, there's too many people with degrees. Number two, um, what university is actually teaching you is becoming less and less relevant for the workforce. Yeah. Um, and less, less correlation with uh, success. So what will, what are the signals that will replace the university degree, the diploma as the signals that, you know, employers and society as a whole will kind of latch on, will use for to make decisions to, you know, decide what your salary should be, decide whether or not you can get a job. Um, so what are those signals? Who's gonna give those signals? Why do you trust those signals? Who do you get them from? Are they based on the fact that you took an assessment, the fact that you um, has been you have been exposed to some content? I mean, what are those signals, and how, what's the whole ecosystem of those signals? Would you say that the job of trying to figure out what the future of learning looks like has that become easier or harder? Is it um, is it becoming clearer where? you think the world is headed or or has all this recent whatever last few years of of evolution actually made it harder to figure out which which direction it's going to go into 
I think is becoming richer because I think if you went back, if you went back 10 years, I think if you went back 50 years, you know, the challenge or, you know, 30, depending on the country, right? I mean, I come from Brazil, things operate in a different time, time scale there. But um, I think there is the challenge, let's say in the second half of the 20th century was, okay, how is it that I get uh, as many students into school with a decent enough education? And then there's a bunch of those a small percentage that will kind of make it to university and they'll be the elite kind of with the elite jobs right if you make that mm -hmm. machine work well you, you know society will do fine you have uh, people trained for all the all the job and society will be happy and then later it's like okay there's more uh, there's more knowledge the the, the the knowledge economy emerges more services less manufacturing so less kind of trade jobs so you need more people in university so then you need to say okay how do i get more people to, kind of through the sausage machine to kind of graduate from high from high school secondary school make it into university with good quality right so i think in the last let's say the, the year the 90s and the, the first decade of the 2000s was basically about that right let's put as many people in university so you have a uh, uh, all the all those private universities in the US uh, and in my country as well, there was a big push to kind of open new universities, make it affordable with um, uh, uh, student loans, etc. And now yeah. all of a sudden it's like, yeah, yeah, but that that we worked so hard for is actually not giving what we want because we, people have graduated from high school, have graduated from university, and yet they are not ready for the workforce and employers are not happy and they're not getting jobs. So th there's still a gap, right? I mean, it, it's how crazy yeah. it is that, you know, the complaint is I'm a student, I can't get a job, I'm full of debt. And, you know, in the same, oh, in the same room, you have someone saying, I'm an employer, I can't find talent. It's like, okay, there's a massive <laughs> yeah. gap there, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and the, I think there is there's layers and layers of uh, of challenges. I think universities are, by definition, pretty rigid, conservative because they sell stability, right? I mean, the, the the brand is stability. I've been here forever. You can trust me. So, by definition, they cannot change too fast. I remember when I was law, in law school, they introduced uh, like a change in the curriculum of um, private law, civil law, and I remember the second years coming to me and saying you should not let it happen. You, you should not let this happen. You know, they're taking risks with your curriculum. You know, why would you change it? And, and, and so by <laughs> definition, there's this, there's this uh, reluctancy, right? This fear of change. Yeah. So uh, it makes it hard for anyone to, uh, to adapt. I like metaphors and, uh, you know, comparisons. So mm -hmm. I think, um, I think the best way to look at this is I think previously we were in the business education was like you would you would teach someone to be a football player and they would be really good at playing football and that's what they done they would do like their whole life and now it's much more about you need to make them into great athletes you know like generally you know strong uh good uh, stamina you know good uh you know, stretchy and lean and muscular but you know try to optimize for kind of everything and the ability to learn new things right it's like you, you need to be an athlete that can flex between sports it's like okay we're done with football now you're going to play baseball we're done with baseball you're going to play golf so it's a little bit like this it's uh is the is the skills that you that you will teach that become more relevant or not this or let's say skills capabilities is 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 less the thing that they know and more the ability to to be constantly updating that or to be leveraging old knowledge to learn new knowledge so the flexibility of a uh, of being always learning right i mean we you and i spoke speak about mm -hmm. this a lot so, so it's a it's someone's ability to learn is very relevant but it's how do you how you do it right uh, so it's less about um I'll teach you how to play piano. I mean, I am, you know, they know this, you know, I, after my, my uh, lockdown project was to learn the piano and it, it's crazy because you can, it, the, the teacher can come to you and teach you piano, but if you don't practice, you won't learn. Right. And, and you need to, you need to learn how to learn because if you keep just playing the piece, 
it will be very slow. There are ways to learn that makes make the make to make the learning more efficient. So I think that's the key, right? Is is that will be the kind of the differentiating skill in the future is the ability to have a toolkit to switch from capability to capability, from, from skill to skill, um, to be like a flexible, agile learner. When I started in education about 10 years ago, I was shocked with how little science there is. <laughs> it's, I'm yeah. shocked because uh, people are very passionate about education because it really, it's important and, you know, teachers really love what they do. You know, it, it was really, uh, you know, it's a work of love, but that makes it very, impermeable to kind of uh, con randomized controlled trials and uh, <laughs> hard science and hard facts. So there's a lot of like, no, that's not how you should teach ch children or that children, they yeah. need to be the protagonists of their own learning. There's a lot of like uh, ideologically loaded concepts that, you know, maybe mm -hmm. they, they are true, but maybe not. But, you know, I haven't, I mean, show me the numbers. Have you tried this and that and compare the effects? So there's not much mm -hmm. of that also because it's hard to do a lot of education kind of plays out in very long timelines and that makes, you know, science mm -hmm. experiments more complicated and, uh, lots of, uh, covariance and other things that kind of play into it. But I think, um, I think, uh, there will be more science and now we can measure more, right? I mean, you can do more yeah. brainwave scanning, etc. I think there will be more, uh, more of that. There was, I mean, there's it, historically, there's very little, um, very little uh, measurement in science. As you think about your, maybe your investments today and not, not, not with any particular examples, but like mm -hmm. what with the ev evolutions in the last few months, what are the things that you are most excited by that might, that might not have seen the light of day yet and that you think will see the light of day either towards the end of this year or kind of start of next somewhere? I think, you know, there's one thing that educators have been talking a lot about for a long time is the power of AI to create personalized learning journeys, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so far it's been uh, like an algorithm, right? It's like, okay, you know enough of this, you can, yeah. you can move to the next one, right? But um, mm -hmm. I think if AI really unlocks the ability for a virtual tutor to teach concepts in the way that makes it easier for a in the, for that individual to learn based on what yeah. the person already knows or based on feedback, et cetera, that would be very powerful because, you know, really personalization is really understanding who the person is and then kind of adjusting the message to that individual. And, uh, and that's not what was happening. Most of the platforms that say, oh, it's an, it's intelligent, it's adaptive, et cetera. So I think if, if, um, if you can get enough data points to get there. So if I say, I don't know, you know, uh, teach me, uh, the, you know, laws of gravity. And they, they explain to me in a way, it's like, I don't understand it when I explain like this. And they can go and come at it from a completely different perspective, kind of starting with different examples, you know, connecting with, yeah. with different previous uh, knowledge, scaffolding in a completely different way, but based on what they know about me, you know, previous data points, et cetera. I think that can be, can be very, um, that can be very, um, very powerful. There's something that is not necessarily education, but it's, it's, it's funny how at Pearson, one thing we find ourselves struggling with all the time is that education is blending into employability a lot, right? Yes. Because ultimately what, when you think education, there is, um, there is a, a kind of a humanity angle. It's like, you want to create good citizens that are, you know, can engage with their environment in a healthy way and with society, et cetera. But then. When push comes to shove, a lot of it is like employability, right? I mean, can you yeah. find a job that is fulfilling and you can pay the bills and can be a productive citizen and happy about yourself, you know, have a family uh, and, yeah. uh, and you know, fit with society. It's a bad way to say, but it's, a, and you know, can you connect with a job that gives you the fulfillment you want in life? So employability is a big part of it. So I think helping people navigate the skills that they need to do the things they want to do in life 
uh, um, help like it's almost like career counseling mm-hmm. 2.0 right i think that yeah. would be really interesting because today not only that's very poorly done based on very outdated models but it's also um is very shallow right it's like oh yeah. you like uh, you like a challenging challenging routine and you like to you like to talk to people you like human contact and you like uh energetic conversations oh you should be in sales right so it's it's mm-hmm. almost like yeah. one of those iq tests from the 50s right yeah. it's, it's a bit simplistic <laughs> as we are more and more reliant on ai and technology to kind of help us perform various tasks how do we or or what is your thinking about trying to mitigate how we don't become over reliant on it is that even a thing um how how do you think about this in a world where or more and more of this is 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 done by technology and we kind of lose our ability to to think critically about all of this that is such a great question and it reminds me of one of the best books i've read uh you probably read it it's kevin kelly uh what technology wants so it's a beautiful book because he talks about technology as a the trends that permeate technology but since the invention of fire as the first technology right so um mm-hmm. or you know anything a stick is a technology the financial system is a technology but so it's beautiful it's a great book and i think honestly you just cannot fight it you just you just cannot fight it because every time humanity humans develop a technology that improved their lives they became dependent on it and it's fine because you incorporate yeah. it into humanity, right? The thing is, is you just have to be ready for it to fail and then you have to live with the failure, right? I mean, sometimes there's no power. Sometimes there are no buses because it's snowed. You know, sometimes uh, there's no running water, right? So I think is is, yeah. but society has to be ready for the cost. So, I mean, do we lose something when we rely too much on technology? Absolutely. Can you plant your food? I can't. Can you hunt your food? <laughs> I can't, right? Yeah. You know, could I walk for five days and figure out, you know, where to sleep because I'm migrating to escape the winter? No, I can't. So, but it's fine, right? Because it's fine yeah. because most of the times, yeah. most of the times, once you have a technology it, that kind of gets embedded into society, it never goes away. You can rely on it. It'll always be somewhere. Maybe it's very often it's unequal and it's not distributed equally around society. So there is this massive question of the gap, but it will be there, right? There are very, very few examples, if any, of technologies that were useful, that were widespread and then all of a sudden disappeared and you cannot count on them anymore. Maybe humanity is reaching a point where that might happen because now there's 8 billion of us and you know the, the impact on the ecosystem is different, but, um, and but I think in general, it's okay. We'll be okay. Yeah. 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 That's a, that's a, actually, it's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. You know, we've always become reliant on new technology. If it was good enough, then the risk basically outweighs the, sorry, the reward outweighs the risk, which means that you just have to handle the risk. That's a, and you fall back to it. the last one, right? I mean, in, yeah. I mean, let's, let's, uh, mm. You know, I read a lot of sci-fi and there's a bunch of sci-fi books where you have, you know, there was World War Three, and then, you know, the internet doesn't exist anymore. Would it be shocking? Yes, it would. But, you know, you adapt, right? So you adapt and then maybe there's no electricity. Okay, you adapt. It hurts more. But but maybe remember, yeah. you can find out a cheap way to do electricity or a simple way. And then you kind of uh, over 20 years, you kind of get back to where you were. So I think, um, I think uh, uh, it feels... Maybe it's because it's been too fast, right? I mean, from mobile phones becoming a thing in whatever, the 90s to now everyone literally is a cyborg. Without my, I mean, without my phone, I'm losing a limb, right? I mean, I, I, I'm missing a limb. Yeah. So I am a cyborg. I need my phone with me. I need my shoes, everything. Everyone is a cyborg. Well, so on that note, those were um, the questions that I had uh that weren't weren't that I hadn't asked you about before. So the um, mm. question I always wanted to finish with was the what is the biggest question you have right now? What is a question you have that you wish you had an answer to? So 
So I think, um, so the question I have is that that would be truly, truly, truly transformative and, and transformative like with a massive capital T is, are we going to be able to crack the technology brain interface? That is the big question because that changes everything. I don't care about AI. I don't care about, you know, fire, but you know, that changes everything. Because if you think about what a human being is, a human being is a machine that evolved to preserve the genes, right? That's, it's a, it's a gene perpetuating machine. And once you have, when, if you have a neural link, a neural link is working, basically the whole point of the body disappears because your consciousness if you figure out Neuralink, probably means that you figured out how to replicate a brain, you know, on silicon, right? You can take whatever was on carbon-based storage on your brain and you can update, <laughs> up, upload it to silicon-based storage in the cloud. If, you, <laughs> if, that, if that happens, you just don't need the bodies anymore, right? So it, that is really, really mind-blowing. So, so, so it, it's scary yet, you know, fascinating because then you know, you can replicate humans, you can improve humans, you can store humans, you can send a human on a USB drive to the moon or to another system. So it just, that is, that is the real question, right? So <laughs> maybe it's too big, you know, the, yeah. I went further than you wanted, Josh, but... Uh, no, no, that, it's, uh, yeah. I'd say there are almost two questions in there because the, there's the human brain interface and there's the what is consciousness, right? The, um, because the, the, the interface with the brain, I think we're almost there. I mean, there have already there are already some things where you can just direct a computer based on your thoughts. Like those things exist. Um, it, does yeah, that not, mean, I mean consciousness they can, is transferred? Yeah, yeah. yeah but I think I think yeah. I mean, I think between you know directing mm. something with your brain the way it's done today, and I play with some of those technologies and actually mapping the brain in the sense that you can replicate yep. it. You know, it's really yes, it's like the yeah. Alexander Graham Bell telephone and an iPhone. So there's is really. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, but that's sad. I mean, how many, many, a hundred years between the two? So it's <laughs> yeah, exactly, and it's going to go much faster now. So. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, and the consciousness is a is a really is a big one. Is a really big, uh, is a really yeah. big uh, big question. Um, we've had a session at Pearson about uh, strategic foresight, uh, how to actually kind of look for those prompts, what's coming for the future, how to think about them. And uh, we ended up going down this rabbit hole um, of uh, <laughs> what is consciousness. And yeah, <laughs> it's an interesting one. It is, yes. So we just had a bunch of different questions. Do you have any idea which one might have been written by ChatGPT? I think is, the, is, the, is this last one, the biggest question I have right now that you wish you had the answer to. No, it wasn't. <laughs> Yeah. It was the uh how do we mitigate the effects of reliance on AI um as as it evolves. It's yeah. looking for ammunition to defend itself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's the yeah, it's the <laughs> It is coming. <laughs> uh, cool. Interesting. Very interesting. Thank you. Well, thank you. Like, really, really like the conversation. Um, it's it's crazy how much like it, it t always takes at least for me like a little while to get into. But like, this is it is actually better in VR for me than just doing this on a Zoom call. I don't know for for you, but in in terms of normal conversation, I I definitely feel you know I feel what like I feel stronger. It, it, ha it helps you to focus. Um, yeah, it helps you to focus, right? Because you don't have distractions around you. It, you know, I, I didn't turn off my teams and it was pinging here, but you know, I'm not on my computer. So it's, um, yeah. I think it's easier for you to feel, let, let's put it this way. I feel more, this is more comparable to a face-to-face -face conversation than maybe a Zoom call, I think. Yeah. Uh, uh, I have to, yeah, maybe, maybe. I'm not 100% convinced, I have to think. But, uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, it, it does feel surprisingly, 
surprisingly good uh i think you know still looks like a like a very old-fashioned avatar i think that has to improve oh absolutely yeah, um, yeah i think uh, <laughs> capturing micro expressions it does a, it does an okay job of capturing micro expressions and what you're doing with the body but oh. uh, i think when that happens uh, you know so you, have you seen some of the some of the headsets they have micro sensors now where they touch the face your face yeah to capture i tried i did that yeah. i had the um i had the the quest pro mm -hmm. um and it that actually gets in the uncanny valley um i i returned it because it it tries to mimic when you're smiling like all of this stuff and yeah. um the first time i joined a meeting people genuinely got a bit freaked out because it was not, it was on that exactly the wrong, like my smile was like a very, I've been told it was really scary when they looked at me, they're like, what are you doing? Exactly. So, so it's, like, it's, it's not quite there. Every time someone says, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah Kenny Valley, I think about that dancing baby. There was one of, you remember the dancing baby from like the early yes. 2000s? Oh my God, yeah. that was so spooky. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. it's not too far from that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have a great day and thanks again for the time. You too. And then talk soon. Take care, Josh. Bye. I'm your host, Joshua Vola, CEO at Mindstone, and I hope today's conversation shed light on at least some of the problems we're facing. If you thought today's conversation was interesting, I invite you to subscribe to our podcast by searching for hashtag AskWhy in your favorite podcast app or follow us on YouTube or TikTok and catch the video feed of these conversations, which are happening in VR. Thank you.